And designed by Gillian Waring, the Turner Prize winning artist, and she's now going to be the first female British sculptor to have her work displayed in Parliament Square. So if we're all ready, let's count down to the unveiling. Five, four, three, two, one.
Good morning, everyone. Ooh, that's better. That was the March of the Women, 
regarded as the anthem for the suffrage movement and performed for us by the suffragist singers, an ensemble brought together for this ceremony this morning. They don't normally sing together. They're based in different parts of the capital. So they were brought together in a unique performance and conducted by Joanna Tomlinson, who is the director of the Constanza Chorus. So very many thanks to them for setting us off on the right note. I'm Michelle Hussein, and it's my privilege to guide you through a ceremony that Millicent Garrett Fawcett, who died 89 years ago, could not have imagined. The cause to which she dedicated decades of her life, Votes for Women, changed the country for the better, and it's to honor that cause and her personal contribution to it that we've all gathered here in Parliament Square this morning. Prime Minister, Mayor of London, ministers, parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, everyone who's here in the square and everyone who's following the events here from different parts of the country, welcome. We're here in Parliament Square, women and men, people of different political persuasions, backgrounds, ages, walks of life, people from organizations working to improve the lives of women in Britain right now. Today, for the first time, the image of a woman will stand amongst the 11 men whose lives are commemorated by statues in this square. It's a square at the heart of our democracy, beside the building in which our laws are made. And a hundred years ago, some British women gained the right to have their say in who those lawmakers are. Today, we commemorate that moment in the nation's history and the women who made it happen. And when the statue is unveiled shortly, the words that we, you will see on it have a special resonance in the story of women's suffrage. They are the words of Millicent Fawcett herself, and they have inspired a poem written especially for today by the award-winning poet, Teresa Lola. And Teresa is going to read it for us now. Good morning. This poem is titled, For Those Who Listen When Courage Calls. Addressee. This is for those who stand beside and not behind. A leader without support is a bell without a clapper, is a thunder with no bass. This is for Minnie Baldock, for Louisa Garrett Anderson, for Margaret Ashton and the over 50 others. This is for the men who campaign too, for the men who unpeel the spike riddled layer of privilege from their body without crying over its loss. This is for Dame Millicent Fawcett for she whose selflessness was a gift she never stopped unwrapping, for she who in 1918 opened a floodgate for change, a year where the first women were given the right to vote. This is also for the women with names but without a mouth to echo them, the ones who fought even when the sky was a veil drowning their colored faces. This is for Caroline Criado Perez, who started the petition to commemorate women's suffrage with a statue this is for Gillian Waring who created the statue. This is for the women who continue to prove that a mountain is moved not by the flicker of whispers, but by a rapture of hands. This is for those who listen when courage calls, who stand by the phone so often, the ringing sound now rests in their bodies. Timestamp, 1866, at 19, Millicent Fawcett had started petitioning to parliament for women's suffrage. She folded violence behind her ear and use knowledge as a cement to build everything on. Because a woman who has knowledge will see the palm lines of her hands bloom into a map of the world. Today, women make up 33% of local councils in England, but 15% in leadership roles. Still, I praise change, but dare it to stop crawling and run faster, because protesting has no emotional expiry date. Statue. Wearing a half bronze pinkish grey nightgown, Millicent Fawcett will stand poised, watching the world from Parliament Square. Because a woman is powerful even in stillness, 
because a young girl will point at her and ask for a story to conjure up, because visibility is a portal for another woman to see and enter. Signed letter. This is for they who listen when courage calls, who stand by the phone so often the ringing sound now rests in their bodies. This is for those who fight to take on the name, the first woman to be. Many plaques still left to be written on. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. It was two years ago that the journey towards this morning's unveiling began. When a campaigner who had already pushed the Bank of England to again put a woman on one of our banknotes turned her attention to this space and to the absence of female public figures from it. Millicent Fawcett would have been puzzled by some of the methods of those campaigns, petition signing online and hashtags, but she would certainly have recognized their principles and their spirit. Please welcome the campaigner and writer, Caroline Criado Perez. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this all started just over two years ago when I took my dog Poppy, who sadly couldn't be here, uh, for a run. It was the 8th of March, 2016, International Women's Day. I'd just been on one panel and had some time to kill before the next one, so I decided to run between them. We ran along the river, across Westminster Bridge, and into Parliament Square. I ran past Winston Churchill, David Lloyd George, a guy I'd never heard of at the time called Jan Smuts, and I slowed down, and I stopped. These statues, they were all of men. Were they all of men? Surely not. I walked around the square looking at them. Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, Abraham Lincoln. These were impressive men, for sure, but there was no getting away from the fact that they were all, well, men. All 11 of them. I couldn't believe it. It was 2016. How had this not already been sorted? I didn't want to sort it myself, to be honest. I already knew from my fight to get a female historical figure on our banknotes how much a campaign takes over your life. So I just sent a tweet, and I thought, maybe someone else will get as angry as I am. But as I carried on running through St. James's Park, I couldn't get it out of my head. As I rounded Green Park, I realized I was composing the campaign text in my head. When I came back round to Buckingham Palace, I gave in to the inevitable. I sat down on the ground and I set up a petition on my phone. 85,000 people signed it. Then came the London mayoral elections and Sadiq Khan, who in his mayoral campaign had promised to be a proud feminist in City Hall, had won. So I thought, let's see if this proud feminist is up to scratch. I arranged an open letter published in the Telegraph and signed by a group of incredible women, some of whom are here today, including actors, authors, businesswomen, MPs, and baronesses. Two days later, we heard from Sadiq. The proud feminist was in. A month later, Sam Smethers from the Fawcett Society and I found ourselves in a meeting at City Hall with Leah Kreitzman, the Mayor's Director for External and International Affairs, Justine Simons, the Deputy Mayor for Culture, and Kirsten Dunn, Senior Cultural Strategy Officer. It's fair to say I was pretty intimidated, but I needn't have been. Working with this group of dedicated women has been amazing. I've learned so much from them, not least about how to commission a public work of art, which it turns out is slightly more complicated than just making a massive fuss in the Telegraph, although that does help. But we got there in the end, helped along by an announcement from the government that they were gonna pay for it all, which, as you can imagine, I was delighted by. Women are still woefully underrepresented in all areas of British cultural and political life, not least in its statues. When I counted all the statues in the UK's public monuments and statues database, I found that there were more statues of men called John than there were of historical women. There are actually quite a few statues of Queen Victoria, and I kind of actually have a grudging respect for her very unladylike love of putting up statues of herself. But if 
If you exclude her, less than 3% of British statues feature a woman who actually existed. With this statue of Millicent Fawcett, the first statue of a woman, and the first statue by a woman in this iconic location, we're making one hell of a start on changing that. Thank you. Caroline, thank you very much. I think next time Caroline launches a campaign, we should just get it done straight away rather than, because we know how these stories are going to end when she gets involved. And now it's time to see the statue. Caroline and Teresa Lola will be among those unveiling it. And they're going to be joined by Justine Simons, Deputy Mayor for Culture and Creative Industries, who's representing the Statue Commissioning Group, by nine-year-old Agatha Crombie from Millbank Academy, 15-year-old Amina Precious Ngabale from Platanus College in Lambeth. And I'm delighted to welcome Millicent Fawcett's great-grand-niece, Jennifer Lonis, who's one of the great-granddaughters of Millicent's extraordinary sister, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, the first British woman to qualify as a doctor. So they're all in place holding the ropes um, that are over the statue covering. It's been designed by Gillian Waring, the Turner Prize winning artist, and she's now going to be the first female British sculptor to have her work displayed in Parliament Square. So if we're all ready, let's count down to the unveiling. Five, four, three, two, one. So thank, thank you very much to Caroline, Teresa, Justine, Agatha, Amina, and Jennifer. And thank you, Gillian Waring, for creating the image of Millicent Fawcett. The words you see on it, Courage Calls to Courage Everywhere, are taken from a speech that was given by Millicent Fawcett at a seminal moment for the suffrage movement after the death of the suffragette Emily Wilding Davison, who was fatally injured at the Epsom Derby in 1913. Millicent Fawcett lived to see women gain equal voting rights to men in 1928, which was part of why, at the end of her life, she could say she had a cheerful confidence in things to come. Even so, I suspect the idea of a woman prime minister, let alone two, would have seemed to her a pretty faraway prospect. Please welcome now the Prime Minister and the Right Honourable Theresa May MP. Behind me, outside the Supreme Court, stands a statue of the great emancipator. To my right, we see the man who did more than any other to gain independence for India. Opposite Parliament, the man who saved Europe from the grip of fascism. They are all great men, important men, men who deserve their places in history and in this square. But I would not be standing here today as Prime Minister no female MPs would have taken their seats in Parliament. None of us would have had the rights and protections we now enjoy were it not for one truly great woman, Dame Millicent Garrett Fawcett. The struggle to achieve votes for women was long and arduous. Dame Millicent was there from the beginning and devoted her life to the cause. As a teenager, she collected names for the first pro-suffrage petition, even though she was too young to sign it herself. As a young woman, she overcame a dislike of public speaking and took to the platform at the first women's suffrage meeting to be held in London. For decade after decade, in the face of often fierce opposition, she travelled the country and the world, campaigning not just for the vote, but on a whole range of issues. She was a tireless advocate for equal access to education, pressuring universities to admit women on equal terms and establishing her own Cambridge College. 
She fought for the rights of sex workers, convincing politicians to overturn the discriminatory Contagious Diseases Act. She campaigned to protect children from exploitation and abuse, reported on the treatment of civilians in the Boer War. She was even responsible for Blake's and did those feet in ancient time being set to music by Sir Hubert Parry. History has many authors. In our own small way, we each help to shape the world in which we live. But few of us can claim to have made an impact as significant and lasting as Dame Millicent. And it is right and proper that today she takes her place at the heart of our democracy. On On behalf of the whole country, I would like to thank all those who have made this possible. Caroline, of course, who spearheaded the calls for a lasting memorial to Dame Millicent. Sculptor Gillian Waring, who has created a beautiful and fitting tribute. Community Secretary Sajid Javid, who steered the project on behalf of the government from conception to completion. And everyone who supported the campaign for this statue over the past two years. From Lord Finkelstein, a vocal advocate from the beginning, to the tens of thousands of individuals who signed petitions, wrote letters, and lent their backing in so many ways. And to the others here, the mayor and others who've had their role in this statue. This statue is your statue. After Fawcett's death in 1929, a tribute in one newspaper read that whenever a new victory has been gained by women or some individual woman has found her way in at a new door, the minds of many have turned at once to Dame Millicent. Almost 90 years later, it is all too easy to forget those who forged a path for generations of women to follow, to take for granted the progress that they achieved through years, decades of bitter struggle. We do so at our peril, because the fight for equality is far from won. And as long as that is the case, we will need brave women and men to stand up and speak out in the face of injustice and discrimination. Doing so will not always be easy, but courage calls to courage everywhere. And for generations to come, this statue will serve not just as a reminder of Dame Millicent's extraordinary life and legacy, but as inspiration to all of us who wish to follow in her footsteps. Thank you, Prime Minister. And now the words of Dame Millicent herself will be brought alive for us by the actor Helen McCrory. She's going to be reading from a speech called Looking Backwards that Dame Millicent delivered in March 1918. A hundred years ago, one month after the victory had been won and the first women in the UK had secured the right to vote, Millicent Fawcett, who had spent her life campaigning for women's suffrage, delivered a victory speech at the Queen's Hall in London. Here is an extract of that speech. I have often said what I most devoutly believe, that the suffrage movement through all its 50 years of existence in practical politics has made continuous and fairly rapid progress. I've gone as far to say when invited to describe the ups and downs that I cannot do this because it has all been ups and no downs. There were, no doubt, moments of disappointments, but those whose disposition and training led us to take the long views never doubted for a moment that ultimate success was certain, as if the fortress of ignorance and prejudice had already been surrendered. Naturally, the most rapid progress was made in those branches of the women's movement that did not require changes in the law and therefore demanded no help from Parliament. But Parliament itself, even in the apparent inaccessible upper chamber, is human and is part of the public and is profoundly influenced by public opinion. Consequently, 
every woman who did good work as a poor Lord Guardian, or a member of a school board, or of a factory inspector, or of as a doctor, or in any other sphere useful outside the time-honored occupations which have also been recognized as women's sphere, helped form public opinion and gave it a bias in favor of extended opportunities for women. The speed of the movement increased by its own momentum, but everyone acknowledges how extraordinarily it has been stimulated by the war. That was not due to sentimentality, nor less to terror, but to the readjustment by the man on the street of his conception of the sort of work that women are fit to do and the sort of things women will be thinking about and interested in. Now, the comments of hostile observers were verily enlightening on the changes of public opinion. The late Mr. Goldwyn Smith, who thought his own country unworthy of his citizenship and betook himself to the other side of the Atlantic, revisited from time to time and never failed to make sarcastic comments on the progress of the women's movement. On one occasion, he observed, next time I come back, I shall expect to find a woman and a horse standing for Southwark. Looking back over the last 50 years for the work for women, I can truly say it has been a joyful and an exhilarating time, punctuated by victory after victory. What we were able to do without suffrage, without the vote, is in the highest degree encouraging for our successes. They, with franchise, with the vote to back their efforts, will be able to do so much more than we. I can only hope that those who are beginning their work now may have as joyful a 50 years before them as I and many of my dearly loved colleagues have to look back on. Things done are one. Joy soul lies in the doing. Thank you, Helen. Around the base of the statue, there are photographic etchings commemorating 59 people other than Millicent Fawcett who played key roles in achieving universal suffrage. Four men are among the 59. One man is among this morning's speakers. He supported this campaign on his first week in office, setting up the Suffrage Statue Commission. Please welcome the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Thank you. Wow, what a morning. Today is a truly historic day, as we've just unveiled the first ever statue of a woman to stand here in Parliament Square. And by the way, it's also the first statue here to be created by woman Gillian Waring. As Caroline said, her letter calling for a statue of a woman on this great square was one of the first to land on my desk when I became mayor. And saying yes to a fantastic campaign was a no-brainer to me. Let's show our appreciation to Caroline Credo Perez. <laughs> Almost two years on, this is a moment of celebration as we see the vision becoming a reality. A moment that is only tempered by the fact it really should have happened many decades ago. All those, all those who played a part over the last two years deserve our thanks.
It's simply not right that this historic square has been a male-only zone for statues. Because statues matter. They're a symbol of our values, a demonstration of the importance we place on hard battles won, both in peace and in war, and an expression of who and what we choose to celebrate. So it's vital that we fix the imbalance and ensure more women are celebrated in our public spaces. And as you look around, we're surrounded by statues of some of the greatest figures from history. And it's perfectly fitting that we now have Melissa Fawcett standing beside them. For they're all people who led the way in changing the world for the better and who still inspire us today. They remind us of some of our most important struggles, the fight against fascism, the fight against racism and slavery, and the fight against gender inequality. Millions of people pass by these great monuments every year, and I hope that this new statue will help to inspire young people in particular who stand below and look up at this incredible role model. The plinth includes portraits of well-known figures in the suffrage movement, but it also includes many women who haven't been given the recognition they deserve. Women like Sophia Dalip Singh, an unsung suffragette of South Asian heritage. And Jessie Cragen, a working class suffragist who toured the country persuading others to join the fight for gender equality. You know what? No photos of her exist. Unsung heroes. <laughs> this year we mark the centenary of the first women to secure the right to vote. And by the way, isn't it good to see the colours of the suffragettes and suffragists flying proudly in Parliament Square. This is a time to appreciate how far we've come, but also an opportunity to take stock and to acknowledge that the original goal of gender equality hasn't been reached. Of course, progress has been made. Women are leading every level of society from science and tech to arts and politics but there is still so much more to do. As with all important changes in history, we won't get there without a concerted effort by all of us, both women and men. So let this statue be a constant reminder that we must not rest. And let this unveiling be a moment where we all commit. Commit to ensuring that the achievements of women throughout our history are never forgotten. Commit to breaking down the barriers that still exist to women reaching their potential and commit to standing on the shoulders of the giants that came before us, like Melissa Fawcett, and carrying on their mission to make this country a more just, fair and equal place for all. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, we're almost at the end of the ceremony. Millicent Fawcett is in her rightful place, gazing out at the Houses of Parliament. Just before we close, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister, the Mayor, Caroline Criado Perez, Teresa Lola, and Helen McCrory for all playing a role in this morning's events. Thank you. Well, we began with music, and we're going to end that way too with part of the musical Sylvia, which comes to the London stage this autumn. It celebrates Sylvia Pankhurst, daughter of Emmeline, and also a campaigner, organizer, speaker, and activist 
who herself experienced imprisonment and force feeding. The music has been written by Kate Prince and Priya Palmer. The musical has been written by them. The original music was written by Josh Cohen and DJ Wild. So, please welcome the cast of Sylvia with March, Women March. It's only the second time that the song has been heard in public. From all of us, thank you and goodbye. Hey! Step to war. 